well, in the most Canadian fashion I can muster, um, what the hell happened, eh? <laughs> right, that's what people were asking online, eh? Right, right. What happened? Well, you know, an accident is when three or four or five unlikely things happen at the same time. And I would say, that's what happened. I mean, first of all, I spent last January with you in Zurich yep. at a hospital. I wasn't in the hospital, but I was there most of the time. You're in the hospital a lot. I was in the hospital a lot, yeah. Well, I had to feed you, you know, or make food for you. Yeah, he so brought I was me there steak. through all of January, and you were getting some pretty invasive surgery done on your foot. And then your mom and I, Tammy and I, went to Australia and New Zealand for most of February, and that was actually not too bad a trip. Mm -hmm. I felt all right, and she was feeling all right too, but we knew her surgery for what was hypothetically a relatively treatable cancer was coming up in March, so that was hanging over our heads, although we weren't overwhelmingly worried about it. And then she went and had her surgery, and they... Then we were informed six weeks after that, after she had recovered but was still suffering some pain, that the easily treatable and non-dangerous, slow-growing malignancy that we were told she had was, in fact, something fast-growing with, about a, with a, some, something near 100% fatality rate within a year, regardless of treatment. Mm -hmm. Like brain so, cancer. Like yeah, so that was deadly. We got all we we were told that in about ten minutes, and so when we were just expecting a, well, if not a clean bill of health, at least a re representation of what we'd already been told. And then she went in to have more invasive surgery, and hypothetically that worked, but it created ter terrible side effects, mm -hmm. and that was the start of a whole other six months long nightmare of trying to deal with surgical complications, which we did eventually resolve, but not until mid the middle of August. In fact, not and literally not until the day of our 30th wedding anniversary. Yeah. So that was all hair raising and stressful to say the least. I mean, you and I have talked about that, but we seem to have a life threatening emergency on Tammy's part for about every three days for about six months. And then I had my own problems start to develop really in, with any degree of severity in about April, May, something like that. I had been taking benzodiazepine since 2016. So why, be, before we get into that, yeah. what, why, why did you start taking benzodiazepines? Well... In, in over the Christmas vacation in 2016, you and I and Julian and my son and Tammy went out to Vancouver Island to visit her parents and siblings. And when we were there, you and I and Andre, your husband, ate something that didn't agree with I, any of us and... Sulfites. Had a very severe reaction to that. I'm still on board. It was sodium well, that metabisulfite. Well, that's the most logical conclusion. But I was, well, it the same. We had the same symptoms. I, I don't know if I was any more seriously affected than you or not. But I was freezing cold for about a month. I couldn't get warm, no matter how much I wore. I couldn't stand up without fainting. Um, I couldn't sleep. I don't think I slept at all for for something. On the in the on the order of three weeks. Yeah, people uh, like you went on Joe Rogan and talked about a sulfite reaction you had and how you didn't sleep. And people commented that oh, it's not possible to stay awake for that long. But if you actually look into sodium metabisulfite allergies, the symptoms that we experienced aren't unheard of. There are papers. Well, it's also impossible to stay awake voluntarily that long. That's yeah. not the same as not being able to sleep. Those are very, very different things. Whatever. It's possible that when I was laying there thinking I wasn't sleeping, that now and then I drifted off and would wake up and not notice. I mean, I can't eliminate that as a possibility, but I can certainly tell you that I slept 
little enough so that it was exceedingly unpleasant. It's a very long time to stay awake. And when we went back to Toronto, our family physician prescribed benzodiazepines, which are often used as a sleeping aid and an anti-anxiety medication, and something called Zopiclone, Imovane. And I hardly took the Imovane at all, maybe four or five times. Um, but I took the, um, the benzodiazepine the way that it was prescribed, to, twice a day, 0.25 milligrams. And that seemed to bring the symptoms to a pretty rapid halt, which is also part of the reason I didn't need the Imovane. And then there were so many other things going on around me at that time that I never really thought about it again. You know, I thought they were, that it was a relatively harmless drug and I was taking it in a prescribed fashion at not too high a dose. And I developed symptoms that I now recognized were associated with its use. Um, weakness on the, my left side and like a, a feeling of detachment from people around me, people I loved, uh, some decrease in the ability to experience joy. Um, but it wasn't until much later that I actually associated with the benzodiazepine use. Yeah. Well, then, well when your mom got so sick, my anxiety levels had been climbing up again. Well, yeah, that was unbearable. I mean, the response I had, if you're told your parent or your wife of almost 30 years has no chance and is going to be dead in the next 10 months. That's what we were told. That yes. surgery doesn't help and that chemo doesn't help and that this is a fast-growing cancer and you're screwed no matter what. Right. That's what we heard in one day. So right. yeah, anxiety. Well, then we went all over North America to New York and to Houston and to L.A., looking for different opinions before we decided to settle on surgery, but... And everyone gave us the same opinion. Yes, which was that nothing is going to help, but surgery was probably the best, mm -hmm. the best low probability bet. Yeah, so... So, so, you're, so I asked you know. my doctor to increase the benzodiazepine dose, but what seemed to happen as a consequence of that was that I just got more anxious. Like, so, again, in retrospect, it seems like I had a rather uncommon but not unheard of reaction to benzodiazepines where increased dose makes anxiety worse instead of better. Mm. So then at one point when things weren't getting better and Tammy was still in the hospital, I was trying to take care of her. We had lots of help. I stopped taking them entirely and tried ketamine, which is a treatment for depression. Well, that Neither of those were a very good idea, as it, as it turned out. So, I had to stop taking benzodiazepines entirely In to take the to... ketamine. Oh, and yeah, yeah. Then I didn't go, then I stayed off them for something approximating it was a, it a week. was a week. You not were... knowing that that was a very bad idea. And, and I often think I should have known these things because I did a lot of scientific research when I was a graduate student on alcoholism and I knew that alcohol and benzodiazepines and barbiturates were all the same chemical class at least in terms of their effect on neurological effects and but what I knew about benzodiazepines was that they were comparatively safe compared to barbiturates which they basically replaced but um, that's much less true than everybody who's taking them hopes and they're very widely prescribed. And I don't remember what the probability of developing a dependency on them is if you take them for more than two weeks. It's 50%, I believe. It's something like 50%. Yeah, yeah. if you take them for two or four weeks. Yeah, and, and over four weeks, it's much, much higher. Right. And most people prescribe them, stay on them for life. And that could have something to do with the fact that they're very difficult to get off of. Yeah, well, it was unbelievably unpleasant. I mean, it was unbearably unpleasant. And so I started stopping, started tapering off when Tammy was in the hospital, but I couldn't push that too fast because it wasn't bearable. And what, what do you mean it wasn't bearable? Well, my anxiety levels went higher than I'd ever, than anything I'd ever experienced. And I also developed this condition called akathisia. And the best way I can describe that is that it was like being jabbed with something 
but with a prod, like a cattle prod, something electric or something sharp, nonstop for hours, for all the hours I was awake. It was absolutely, I couldn't sit or lay down or stop moving. And even if I did get up and move, it wasn't like that made it better. I just couldn't stop doing it. It was horrible. Akathisi is horrible. It's, a, it's, it's, well, it's like being whipped. That's another way of thinking about it. Although I really think I would have, you know, this is, sounds melodramatic, but I think if I had to pick whipping or akathisia, I suppose it would depend on how big a whip. <laughs> but maybe not it one wouldn't of those, be an obvious choice. Those five-pronged whips? Yes, yeah. Cat of nine tails, that might be worse. <laughs> but it was, it was plenty bad. Yeah. And so, and things just fell apart more and more. Tammy recovered rather miraculously in the middle of August, and but I continued my sort of downhill spiral and ended up in a clinic in on the eastern seaboard that claimed they could do a rapid yeah. benzodiazepine detox, which was a complete bloody lie. Yeah, well, what we figured was we didn't realize that there was this physical dependency until you stopped to try and do the ketamine, and then we tried tapering and you couldn't stand it because of the akathisia and so we thought well let's go get some professional help right and well and i went to the clinic on the understanding that they could do a multi-day detoxification and treatment for withdrawal and when i got there what they told me instead was that they'd substitute essentially they'd substitute one benzodiazepine for another which wasn't the least bit helpful because clonazepam was already a long-acting benzodiazepine and they're easier to wean off than the shorter acting benzodiazepines and they had nothing to offer essentially i came out of that clinic worse than i when i went in so yeah, like significantly worse yes um, on two more sedative like drugs in order to dampen down the akathisic symptoms right which wasn't helping much given the fact that the benzodiazepines were causing the akathisia yes yeah so and then i went back to toronto that's november november and things maintained their downhill trajectory apart from the fact that tammy was recovering quite nicely, which of course was great. But then I ended up in the hospital in Toronto and the hospital I ended up went in was also worse than useless. Yes. So, and I don't remember this part of it, it, it from December 15th onward, you and Andre, your husband took me out of that hospital and we went to Russia of all places near Moscow to try a treatment offered by a clinic there that used... Uh, they use Propofol and Dextor. Right, right. Propofol to, as a, as a heavy, heavy sedating agent, which yeah. basically made me unconscious for nine days. Yeah, so you were completely out for nine days. Well, I also had pneumonia which I developed yeah. apparently in the hospital in Toronto. Well, yeah, it was quite, quite entertaining, the whole, the whole yeah. string of events. We, we got questions about, you know, why, why on earth would you go to Russia when you could get, you know, world-class care in North America? And the reason for that was because we had tried the Ashton protocol. We Switching over to Valium, we tried the Ashton protocol, and lots of people have success with that, although it sounds horrible. And um, lots of people don't have success with it. Yeah, I I put out a, the first family update we did was when you went to the first rehab center in the States. And after I put that out and said, this is what's going on, uh, I had hundreds, if not thousands of people respond um, telling me how horrible benzodiazepine withdrawal could be, um, how they couldn't work, how they were pacing around their backyards for a year. Um, and they basically said, just keep him alive, make sure he stays yeah, well, alive. They, the psychiatrists that I spoke with said, you know, when I asked them how long the akathisia was likely to last, they said, well, it could be two years. And I thought, no one could live like this for two years. It's like, you can't live for two years if you're being constantly prodded with something excruciatingly painful on a moment to moment basis. It's just not, and there's no escape. There's no relief. 
that's just not possible. It wasn't possible. Or I, I mean, the reason I did survive certainly wasn't because I was enjoying my life. The reason was is that I had family that I was very attached to and friends who went above and beyond the call of duty helping to care for me. But the uh, experience was intolerably dreadful. And it's so strange. Was, we're now in Serbia, weirdly enough, <laughs> in Belgrade of all bloody places. And we've been here about two weeks and went to yet another specialty clinic run by an anesthesiologist. And they mo modified the medication that I was taking in Florida, which is where we were last. And I don't know, I can't understand it, but virtually all my symptoms have disappeared. I'm still weak if I get up and walk around. I don't have my stamina, but I can think clearly. I feel I'm back to my regular self, such as that is yeah. during the mornings and during the days. I can work. You know, it's very surprising to me that this happened so rapidly, but it, it has. And that's why we're doing this podcast and, yeah. or this, this, this video. But, uh, and hopefully it'll last. But... And Tammy is coming. She's been, I haven't been with her for more than a few days since middle of December. And that was partly because I was in bad shape and she wasn't in good enough shape to be patient with me. I mean, oh, no, Jesus, she she's had barely, a terrible time. She almost, she almost died like every day for yeah. six months, like you said. And you were in, you were suffering so much that anyone around you suffered. Yes. Be, because of how horrible it was to watch. It was horrible. So just to back up a bit, um, you went to a hospital in Toronto and they were going to make things worse rapidly. Um, they weren't willing because of your akathisia, which was making you crazy. They weren't willing to slow taper you down. They just wanted to stabilize you by keeping the benzodiazepines there. So Andre and I found a clinic in Russia that would actually put you to sleep using propofol so you wouldn't have to suffer while they took the benzodiazepines out and doing a detox. Or suffer as much. Oh, well, at least you'd be unconscious for that period right. of time. Um, and doing a detox on benzodiazepines isn't recommended. You're supposed to do a slow taper, but your akathisia was so bad that even staying at the same dose right. was dangerous. Right. So we needed to get rid of that. So we spent time in Russia, managed to get it out, and it was horrible. Well, you guys took a big r risk taking me out of the hospital in Toronto, which nobody recommended. The psychiatrists certainly weren't in favor of it. And taking me somewhere as foreign as Moscow and, and then attempting this, what, generally unadvised treatment it was all surreal yeah it, but, was, it was terrifying and when i woke up so as i said too th that was complicated by the fact that i double i had developed pneumonia in both lungs but when i woke up i was first catatonic and then delirious i can remember the delirium that lasted a whole day consisted of a sort of dream-like hallucination that i had been kidnapped by you were you were delirious for nine days nine days yeah nine days mm. you remember the last last day. day yeah i remember that i was kidnapped by people oddly enough who lived in florida and <laughs> they were like very rural backwoods people and florida tree people florida tree people yeah and that they were going to the, the leader of this little gang who kidnapped me were going to kill me because the leader was going to kill me because he he wanted to impress his girlfriend and it was a very very vivid dream that i had while i was awake i knew i was in the hospital at the same time i was just one of the and i also remember that when i first woke up i was irate because um i had been my hands had been secured to the side of the bed because apparently i was tearing out the iv tubes that i was connected to because I didn't want to be in the hospital. I had no idea 
why I was in the hospital or where the hospital yeah, was that, or where anybody I knew was. We had to back up a bit again. <laughs> um, we had agreed when you were in the hospital in Toronto, like our whole family had sat down and agreed that the best option was this rapid detox in Moscow. And you'd been part of that discussion. Um, but when you woke up after the detox in Russia, you couldn't remember any of that. Right. I remember being really angry with you when you first showed up because there were very limited yeah, visiting was, hours, but I didn't know that. It was this, oh man, it was so awful. It was, um, we ended up in like the outskirts of Moscow in a clinic for severely ill people. Yeah. Uh, and it was like Soviet-esque guard guarded. So the visiting hours were two hours from four yeah, to six. And you six. guys were driving how far a day to come and visit? It was like two hours each way. Right, right. Which, and in, 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 in Moscow the deep winter. of winter, in, in rough traffic, <sighs> in bad weather. Yeah. To visit an ICU that was full of people who were in very rough shape, including me. Oh, yeah, you fit right in when you first got there. And at first it was like how, oh, my God, we brought dad to Moscow and destroyed him. Well, that's what the doctor told you, wasn't it? The first, yeah, one when of the we first, first ones said that. Oh, yeah. Um, and I couldn't even, like, there was one day that was so bad I couldn't go in. Um, and Andre went in and they said, you know, why are you here of all places in Russian? And Andre said there was no one to help him in the West, which there wasn't. We looked everywhere, right? And we tried two clinics and talked to multiple psychiatrists and none of them could help. Um, and she said, great, you've brought him here to die. So, and that was, you know, the scary thing about the hospital you were in in Toronto is you had pneumonia that wasn't picked up until we got to Moscow. So when you arrived in Moscow, you had a fever and pneumonia in both lungs. And so when they sedated you... I, and they, they intubated me as they well. They had to intubate you during the sedation because of the pneumonia. So we weren't getting care anywhere and getting off of benzodiazepines almost killed you. And the place in Russia m s managed to stabilize you, but it was... Yeah, to some degree. Like I didn't well, have you a, were, the akathisia was yeah, much could, reduced. Yeah, when the benzos were finally so they um they did some plasmapheresis as well to get rid of the benzodiazepines in your blood because the half life of benzos are so long that even when you stop taking them of it the, takes of that particular kind particularly. Yeah, it takes a really long time for it to get out of your blood. So one of the things they did when you were under was plasmapheresis to get rid of all the benzodiazepines. So when you woke up, the only good thing that had happened was you weren't taking benzodiazepines and you weren't akathisic. You right. were totally screwed, but you weren't akathisic. Right, yes, and that, that was a, a great relief. And then we went, well, we went to a rehab center for a while in Moscow that was less medical and more physiotherapy yeah. oriented. And for a while I couldn't, I couldn't type because I couldn't remember how to put my hands on the keyboard. I couldn't walk up and down stairs because I couldn't see the stairs properly. Um, I couldn't do up buttons. And one night I got up to use the washroom and then came back into the, my bedroom and I couldn't remember how to lay down. It, I tried for about 40 minutes. I couldn't remember the sequence of actions that would enable me to lay down. So this was probably two or three in the morning. I ended up calling for a nurse so that the nurse, who was a very helpful person, could come in and tell me how to lay down. So that was very strange, kind of cortical blindness. So I stayed in there for, what, two weeks? Mm -hmm. And then we went to Florida, where we thought it would be sunny and easier, easier to recover, which yeah, it might have been, but when I was in Florida, the, my anxiety levels were... I wasn't akathisic most of the time, but my anxiety levels were unbearably high. And that, that finally got so bad that I had family members there who were taking care of me. You were there, of course, and Andre, but also my parents, my sister, some friends. My, Tammy came for a while. My son came for a while. But it got to the point where it was obvious that just the care of family members, no matter how well-intentioned, A, wouldn't 
B, sufficient, and B, was just too much to ask of people. The, well, the responsibility yeah. was too great. And so that's when we, you, you and Andre had been communicating with the Serbian medical clinic for about six weeks, something like that, and they'd been quite helpful. Five months. Okay, well, this is partly why we're doing this together is because I don't know all the facts at, at hand. Yeah. But they were helpful. They were helpful. We, um, Andre managed to get in touch with uh, this clinic in Belgrade where it's not, at least people who tr are treating you, it's not run by a psychiatrist, it's run by an anesthesiologist, which seems to be how you need to be treated. Well, it's working for, it seems to be working for me at the present anyways, and that's the best we've got. And it's yeah. pretty good because I felt better. Probably I felt better. See, there are things about the benzodiazepines too that I didn't really understand until I began to decrease their use. I was very, I be, had become quite isolated from my family members. Yeah. I, it was no, most noticeable, I would say, in my relationship with my son. But it was like there was a barrier up between it, me and people. It was noticeable. It was noticeable. I thought, I th attributed that to the strange twists and turns my life had taken in the previous two or three years, because there was no shortage of strangeness on that front. But, and then also I had the strange muscle weakness that plagued me and, I now realize in retrospect that that was all a consequence of benzodiazepine use. So using it, well, this is part of the reason we're doing this, this podcast or video as well, it's to let people know these are very widely prescribed drugs and they are not safe to take for more than two weeks or a month at the absolute maximum. And if you take them longer than that and you end up addicted, you're going to, or dependent, which means that you'll suffer withdrawal symptoms on their cessation, you are going to be one sorry person. Some people, you know, have a better time of it when they stop their use than others. But enough people have a terrible time so that it's an absolute, it's a, it's a medically induced epidemic. It's a complete bloody catastrophe. Yeah. It's probably worse than the opiate epidemic. And that's really saying something. So, and I don't know if I'm out of it or not. You know, I mean, I'm, I have a hard time believing how much better I feel than I did two weeks ago. It's, it's, it doesn't seem plausible. So, you know, it's possible that things will just deteriorate for me again. Although I wouldn't, I don't feel like that at the moment. I feel like things are put back together in an important way. Um, fortunately, one thing I've been able to continue doing through all of this is I'm writing a new book and it's, it's due in the middle of July and that's going quite well. And I was able to do that even when I was in these different clinics, hospitalized in all these different clinics. Although I don't think I did any writing in Russia. No. Not, well, not until the not very the, end. Yeah, yeah. At the very end you did before we went to Florida. Yeah. You were editing. Yeah. Well, I remembered one other thing we were going to discuss. You know, some people, okay, first of all, I've had a tremendous amount of support from family members and friends. Like, really, I mentioned this earlier, but it's worth mentioning again. People have gone far beyond the call of duty to help me and Tammy and I in the last year and a half. And there's been an unbelievably massive outpouring of public support which has really taken me by surprise in some sense because you know it's one thing to be to express your condolences if you're discussing someone who like my wife is suffering from something clearly of her not of that's clearly not of her making cancer for example but a, a dependence is more ethically questionable right because you think well everyone thinks well you know what did the person the person obviously made some errors in choice that contributed to this and that's a reasonable objection but and despite the fact that there are many people who found that their opinions didn't align with mine let's say the proportion of negative comments i got about what i was going through was very small so that was really something. Um, but nonetheless, 
one of the things I wanted to talk to you about today was the fact that what's the old saying, physician heal thyself, right? I wrote a self-help book. I'm a psychologist. It's like, well, why the hell didn't I see this coming? And why wasn't I more cautious? And I think those are, are reasonable questions. Why should people take advice? Well, from and then that's the next question is why should people take anything I say seriously because of that? And I guess what I would say is if you're going to wait to learn from people who don't mistake, don't make mistakes or don't have tragedy enter their life, you're going to spend a long time waiting to learn something. And the second thing I would say is in my lectures and my writings, I've never suggested that I was anything other than one of the people who also needed to learn this lesson, these lessons. So I included myself in the population of people who needed some moral improvement. And, and then the last thing would be, you, you have to make that, the decision about whether or not to attend to anything that I'm doing based on your own judgment about what I've done and said. And if you find that that's not convincing, then that's your prerogative. And if you find that it's useful, then, well, I'm delighted by that, obviously.